Uh, it's Meat and Poison coming to you from Funky Deli in Dusseldorf. I'm Matt. And I'm Andy. Today we are discussing the famous Mexican painter Frida Kahlo. Yes, it is her I mean, birthday. It's, her, it's, it is ever. her birthday on the 6th of uh, July. Salud. Salud. Hmm. I'm going to start with a quote. Mm -hmm which I think uh, describes her life a little bit. Feet, what do I need them for if I have wings to fly? She was born near Mexico City in 1907. She only lived to be 47. She died in 1954. Yeah. She wasn't widely famous during her lifetime, but her popularity has grown since the 70s, especially. Yeah. We're and definitely not famous for art, being an artist, yeah. more for, for being, being an artist's wife. An artist's wife and, yeah. and a personality, I guess. Uh, today, she's considered one of the 20th century Great. greatest or most important artists. We've dressed up for the occasion. We've decided that we would put some colors. Some bright colors on. I, in my case, flowers. Yeah. Uh, which I think is, is fitting for... Um, it is fitting for Frida, although for Frida. as we will discover, her paintings were less, less Flowery joyful, and joyful than, than surfacy. some modern depictions would suggest, maybe. that. Uh, yeah, she, she had quite a life. Um, she had po she contracted polio very early in her life and then had a terrible bus crash which left her both of the things left her in pain for the rest of her life yeah uh, a theme pain that is seen throughout her work or in pain in, and in struggle isn't it i mean she seems to have just from such an early age just yeah. been beset with tragedy and absolutely and things in her way from from living the life that I think she maybe wanted to yeah and why we're discussing that um, is because it's inextricably linked to her art we um, we both think that to actually understand or enjoy Frida to the fullest as far as it, it's yeah. possible I think it's it's essential to have a look at her life and what her horrors um, yeah, I mean, so she, she went on to, to marry Diego Rivera. Um, again, a very tumultuous marriage. She meets him very young. He's 20 years older than her. He's, uh, by all accounts, an absolute womanizer. Um, cannot keep it in his pants, basically. And <laughs> she marries him anyway. <laughs> um, and He's very... Uh, and then divorces him Probably and then marries him again. You, one can say that she had a tumultuous relationship with Diego. Again, as, as Matt has said, he was a serial womanizer. Mm -hmm. She herself had a, had a few affairs with both men and women. Very famously with Trotsky, which... True. Um, yeah, she sheltered in her house for two years. They were sort of staunch communists, we could say. Mm -hmm. Again, very we'll much talk about it a bit later because that's um, the point. Very much part of the... Well, felt they were part of the revolution in Mexico. Um, very pro Mexicanity, Mexicanness, Mexicanness, um, indigenous people. I yeah, mean, there's a whole, free, there's free a Columbia. massive melting pot of things going on in her life that inform her art. Yeah, um, her identity. We'll talk about a bit, a little bit later. If we could just uh, um, stay on the tumultuous nature of her of her life, obviously her um, health continued deteriorating throughout her life. But we are going to have a look at one of your favorite paintings. Yes. Now. And uh, it's not one of the self portraits which were at the core of her work. It's a different one, but Matt will describe it. Like yeah, but this painting, detail. which will be up on the screen now, is called um, What the Water Gave Me. And I, I'm not a huge fan of her self-portraits, personally, because I find them quite hard work. Uh, they're not things I really enjoy. This, I just think, is a, is a wonderful kind of summary of her life. She's got so much into the painting, um, this sort of miniaturization of everything that's then laying on top of her legs, which seemed to be a huge theme of her life because of the polio, because of the bus crash. She was, um, you know, 
where it was really amazing she could walk at all. Yeah. Um, and it just says so much in what at first seems almost a basic painting, I would say. It's not, it's not of the highest um, technical standards, but it, she's just covered all of her life in this sort of, yeah, in this very succinct, mm. very um, arresting fashion, I would say. Mm. It's, uh, it's, it's a good... You good can't stop story. looking at it, and I think yeah. the longer you look, the more you you get from it, as with a lot of her things. Yeah, things. true. And your favourite? Well, my favourite is, I'm not going to say, uh, it's my favourite because because of all the things that I've it's just nice been... It's a nice easy one. It's a nice and easy one <laughs> for a change. Light and surface. Well, <laughs> I actually picked it not because it's a nice and easy one, although it does, to me, celebrate her life more than it mm, bemoans it. It is very colourful and, and very much in step with the colours that she liked to wear and she liked to paint her house in. And she liked to use in, in her other works. But also it's one of the paintings, that's the, the only painting that was purchased by none other than the Louvre yeah. during her lifetime, which is a sure sign of, a, of an artist being uh, renowned and established. I think it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible acclaim. Um, and uh, it is nice to look at. It's a joyful uh, painting and I have also picked it because all the other ones can sometimes be a bit heavy going if yeah. you look at the composite of them in in studying her or in, in looking at a lot of her art and this one uh, kind of stands out a little bit but in a, in a nice and joyful and celebratory way yeah because I was saying I, I wish I'd actually seen this one before when I was I was teaching my niece some art did we do some art lessons over FaceTime and I was teaching her about Frida Kahlo a couple of months ago and we wanted to make flower crowns together and uh, so I was trying to find a nice self-portrait yeah. of, of Frida Kahlo as you see on cushions and things like that to explain to her talk to her a bit about the picture and the more I research and try to find one with a good flower crown, the more you realize that most of them are centered around pain or at least bring quite a lot of it in. And I didn't necessarily want to start explaining to my five-year-old niece about, about horrific bus crashes and miscarriages, miscarriages and womanizing husbands and all sorts of things like that. Um, but it became really impossible to, to just do a, a nice lesson on Frida Kahlo. You can't teach her without teaching about the pain so the one I settled True. on and eventually was a self-portrait where she has a, a necklace of thorns and which are piercing her and making yeah. her bleed which sounds like a hideous thing to show a five-year-old it's not that bad um, no it's not that bad it's actually not so it's hor harrowing images of her life but they're not too I'm not too I would aggressive. say they're not too aggressive yet no, I know what you mean um but yeah it it, it you can't I did we did have to explain then eventually or I explained about the bus crash and that she was in pain a lot and that that came to her art all the time because there just is, are very very few you know I think it was one of the few I know or perhaps a marriage picture as well mm. um, where there's kind of an unrelenting feeling of joy in the picture most yeah. of them which is a quite a juxtaposition with what we see mostly in the reproductions of Frida, you find pictures of Frida Kahlo on cushions, on coffee cups, on t-shirts, uh, wherever. Yeah, which leads us nicely to the next cultural topic we wanted to touch upon, commercialization yeah. of artists. Because it does seem that, I mean, yes, she became very famous after her death. Um, and then has been rampantly much, much more famous yeah. as a female, uh, as a feminist figure, but, but also as an artist. Yeah, and has been rampantly commercialized in the last sort of 20 years, I would say, mm -hmm. to an extent that I don't know if it's such a positive thing. It's uh, because I think it takes away a little from what, what her art actually meant. Because mm. pictures like this, for example, she never made. No. She made pictures like this, which also showed the pain and, and tumult and everything behind what drove her to her art. Um, to be honest with you, I think I would be a little bit disingenuous if I just said, oh, I 
I find magnets rubbish and I don't think that, you know, I think people should look into her life first. I discovered Frida through a commercial product, which is a brilliant, brilliant, beautiful film uh, starring yeah. Salma Hayek from 2002. 2002, early, yeah. Um, a couple of, couple of nearly decades it's ago. It's a stunning film. It's a stunning film. Which to me, and I told you that, uh, that story, I went to the cinema with two of my school friends and we both loved the film. And after the film, one of my friends, who is not the most artsy-fartsy person in, in, in the world I know, she turned to us and she said, guys, can you imagine just going to her exhibition without knowing what the hell was going on in her life? how much it enri enriches you. And the film does such a brilliant job uh, in, in its grammar to show us how her life was depicted in her art l later on. And I think that's, that's kind of oh, the, definitely. the... Back to cushions and cups and magnets. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's definitely a, a positive side of rampant commercialization is that the extent it's such a wider audience that um, it's gonna perhaps attract people more to art, more to exploring artists that they may not have before, which I, I do think is a good thing. I'm not sure if I totally agree that distilling Van Gogh's oeuvre down to the four or five images which are regularly produced on magnets and, and, mm. and coasters and whatever um, does him a disservice or not. It's, it's sort of a question in my head of, where, you know, <laughs> Is it, is it a shame that you're, because I think you agree, you, they tend to be the sanitized images, which are, which are the most popular. It's the nice ones, because of course, you don't necessarily want a picture of someone with a massive bandage covered in blood around their head because they just chopped off their ear. You're probably going to choose to have Starry Night at home instead. Or the sunflowers. Um, yeah, at which totally <laughs> understandable, but- uh, Beautiful pictures in their own right. We're not saying that those pictures perhaps are, do it, not deserve. Yeah, perhaps sort of distilling someone's, uh, an artist's work down to these easily reproducible, easily saleable images, remove something from their legacy. Um, I think in the case of, of Frida Kahlo, it, it does. It does, it does a little bit in the case of Frida Kahlo, but also it brings new admirers and mm. people may be interested in her life. It's an alarming film. Do you have a favorite? part of it because there's so much such a, a, a wonderful mix of styles that they use in there they really sort of s the swap between different sort of cinematic tricks syntax i suppose Cin yeah. yeah cinematic yeah you can cinematographic sy 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 syntax um i would say you know i haven't seen the film in a few years but I, some of the scenes are still very vivid in my memory, and one of mm. them is the is the bus crash. A uh, scene beautiful, so yeah. beautifully done. I wish I knew who the cinematographer or the director of the film were. I'm very sorry that those Julie names. Julie Taymor is the director. God, someone's, someone's someone did been, their research. Someone did their homework. <laughs> So I've got a question for you. Do you do you have a favorite scene from that beautiful film? I do. That actually I brought you to. Yes. Well done, you naps, naps for handy. Where would you, where would you be? <laughs> <laughs> <With that. laughs> um, no, I think my favorite bit's the, when she cuts her hair after her divorce with, um, from Diego, and it, it, they play this beautiful Mexican lament behind it, and it's, a, again, a great mixture of, of what feels very modern with a very old, song with a, with a very classical mm. piece mm. of music behind it um which i just think is 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 a great representation of frida because she was such a fan of mexican culture of of indigenous mexican yeah. culture of promoting that that seemed to be and it's one of your favorite pictures i think is also just after the, the two fridas if we could just uh, quickly show them on the screen uh, the picture that was painted after her divorce if we could quickly show them on the screen. From, are you, as in, I'm are you saying talking to your producers in talking, your ear? Can we just, <laughs> guys, could you just? Uh, <laughs> do you have a team? We have a team of people that figures that out. <laughs> um, it's up. It's, it's up on the screen. Thanks. Um, can we have it like a triple split? <laughs> of me. So I hear the picture is up. Um, <laughs> this one. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, team. 
Great work. <laughs> so this one was done after her divorce from, from Diego Rivera and it depicts her, the two sides, one of which, one of which he loved her uh, indigenous Mexican side and her indigenous dress and the other, the European side, which he apparently supposedly hated. Obviously with some of the detail that you normally see in Frida's paintings, the heart, some, there's some, some blood the background is not exactly <laughs> some joyful. blood. <laughs> well, there is some blood in comparison to yeah. to other pictures. There, there's not too much of it. It's not the point of the picture. Um, we're back to we're back to the studio. We had a, li <laughs> studio. We, we had a little bit of a break. Uh, we've got our beers. So you were you were talking about beers open. Frida's um, joint nationality, as it were. Uh, well, not nationality, but joint joint ancestry. ancestry. And um, yeah, her father was a German. This to, is to put it bluntly. The reason of European descent. This is the reason we're drinking beer today, because um, it fits nicely between Mexico and Germany, mm. both being beer-producing nations. And um, well, so what, much so that we bought this beer in Germany, which is very popular here. Something I found particularly interesting when I first moved to Germany, or even now is the importance of beer here. It was for a while state mandated that everybody should have access to beer. There's the, the Trinkhalle exists, which is a kind of kiosk, but exists so that every man, woman could access beer. It was even price controlled for a long time. And there's still even in some states traditions of having this as part of your work day in Bavaria. There's a Bavarian breakfast. I don't think it happens very often anymore, but there is still this idea of that you would, you would have a certain surprised. amount of beer during your work day. Um, actually, even in my office, there was someone apparently, you know, that only retired four or five years ago who would still drink a half liter of beer at lunch. Um, and the Super healthy. different types of beer are so important to regions. It's yes. really sort of part of the identity. And part of, of, part of Germ Germany, uh, Germany's history, but and, also... And can be quite tricky if you get it wrong, I think. It is... We're not even talking about Bavaria, which is very far from us. E us um, ordering out, which is our local beer of Dusseldorf, where we live in Cologne, which is a city 30 minutes away from where Matt works, for example, would be considered nearly a crime. Well, a misstep. Well, I also don't think you find it. I don't think you'd find... You just wouldn't see... Actually, even even be, cities so close together, I mean, yeah, you, you wouldn't just find wouldn't it. find the regional beer from London because it's kind of a competition thing and yeah. it's a... It's, a, it's, a, it's local pride yeah. a, a little bit, but in a Which good sense, like football. speaks a lot, I think, to German culture in, in general, or what I found here, is that the, the regional identity comes almost before your national identity. I love so. that. <laughs> it's so true for Germany. The idea of, of being a Bavarian or a Franken or whatever would be your first point of where are you from as opposed to I'm, I'm a German. I, I'm not saying these people feel any less German, but I think no. it is, um, in my experience as an outsider, it seems to be much more important than it is certainly in England and other countries that, uh, although again, but between the two of us, only one of um, one of us has been to Mexico. This is true. What was uh, can I ask you about the like, an impromptu, non-rehearsed thing? Can I ask you about your meat and poison about Mexico? What you, among your um, multiple impressions? I was there an awful long time ago. I have to say, well, I, I was um, so 15, 15 and then fourteen, uh, twelve years ago. I was there, but. Um, it's a beautiful country, absolutely beautiful country. I think um, I didn't love, and this is going to sound really snobby, um, the super over commercialized bits of it. Uh, but then that's kind of true of me in any. Which I hated even in Singapore. I completely, it, yeah. I'm, I'm completely um, on board. But there are with areas it. of Mexico which are purely tourist based, uh, Cancun, for example, and. Um, they're very different from the from the, the indigenous Mexico. I mean, the food there is fantastic, um, which we love globally. Yeah, but I think the real food there, because I think that's another thing. Yeah, you know, Mexico has been different. so commercialized their food, been so over simplified into burritos and whatever. Um, but the same happens to Japanese food. Let's 
let's be honest, it's not really this, the very same thing that you would... Yeah, that's I'm true. I'm not talking but about I like proper found, Japanese I've restaurants. I've never found like a proper Mexican restaurant. Yeah. I think that's the thing. You can find a proper Japanese restaurant. But, maybe but just because most we live towns. in the city with the biggest uh, Japanese diaspora. No, but, but do you not uh, think... I can't even... Diaspora. Can't that I, that I've used that word. <laughs> Community. Like to Can we that? <laughs> Diaspora. That's not a good oh, word to use for Japanese. Crushing poor Frida's face. Um, but then Frida, during her lifetime, was a strong advocate of uh, Mexican culture and Mexico. She's often depicted with a, with a Mexican flag in her hand. Mm. But then they traveled to America, and apparently she didn't find it particularly yeah. um well because diego became enormously famous yeah and but she is also then famous because of just by dint of being his wife and she's on the front of vogue and yeah, she, uh, vanity, vanity fair. fair she's like she was a modern day celebrity back yeah. in the day, if we're being completely honest yeah Anyway, I was gonna I was gonna lead uh, to you not being completely on board with um, maybe Diego's and uh, Frida's political views. My meat and poison about them. Well, yeah, because they were back and forth. Uh, I, there were yeah, lots in, I, in the United I've, States. I've found if I were to to nominate a poison, of, I, I do find their use of their communist ideals and being revolutionary affiliation. I, I think they possibly um, projected an ideal of themselves that wasn't true uh, or was was over exaggerated you know they talk about being these revolutionaries being these total communists however Diego goes and takes these commissions from from massive American industrialists so like the Rockefellers and, and Henry Ford um, as we said Frida is, is on the cover of magazines in the States they become celebrities they benefit enormously from a capitalist system Although you do remember the, the, the story about him painting... Painting Lenin. Lenin. Yeah, but I just... I don't know, maybe I'm just being in, very unfair. But paid I, by I, the capitalists. I feel like he's doing it as stunts. Move. You know, he eventually he was gets... A pro, he wasn't a Jean provocateur. He, in, in he, the, he gets thrown out of the Communist Party in the end. Um, you know, I don't see them really living communist ideals. They seem to make a lot of noise about it. Hmm. Um, I'm not a particularly communist myself. So... But I, I do think using using this sort of strong political opinion. Did you just say I'm things. not a communist myself? No. Yeah. Oh wow, that's a surprise for some of our <laughs> viewers and listeners. Explain that. <laughs> no, I'm just saying I'm. You not, are not a communist. No, what I meant was that I'm not annoyed at them specifically. The presence of a lot of red on his shirt. Specifically not. for not being communist, I'm annoyed. At, I, I find them a little bit hard to swallow in that they 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 portray these political images of themselves as being these kind of you know fighters for the people and whatever but i don't think but, but i think it was mostly for professional gain or but listen i agree, i kind of agree with you with diego maybe a little bit although i think he was actually maybe being polarizing more than he um he was trying to maybe make a statement but i don't think frida was political in her art no there's all there's a just wasn't just she claims to be between this... her her uh, different her heritage, her European heritage, her Mexican heritage, be, be, between some of the capitalists, so, so the binary oppositions between the, you know, the capitalists and the indig indigenous, fecund Mexican plant life. I've managed to do this. You managed to get fecund in the. <laughs> I've managed to uh, to, to weave the word in. No, but she claims. But I don't this, think she was she ever. She claims communist. this revolutionary history. She even tries to, you know, pretend yes, that she was born. That's true. In, and three years later, so she could call herself a child of the revolution. It all just smacks a little bit of, yeah, they're trying to commercialize the, these, these political views um, mm. a little bit. A li a li maybe a little bit, but it doesn't really, to me, it doesn't uh, loom large in her work. But you were in, saying in her work. what you would perhaps take as a poison for, for, for Frida was, in fact, also her political views, but then. Um, well, her political, I mean, it, I don't necessarily know every detail about what she believed in, but her declining health, and the fact that she became quite a strong uh, advocate and even lover of Stalin yeah. uh, towards the end of her life, I put it down to her declining health, 
and to me it's a short it does song, seem to be looking at it. She was, she was because we're not talking about Stalin's point. period when he was sort of on the rise and people were thinking oh what a great leader we're talking about um, actually yeah. Frida died a year after Stalin and she she started um, a l um, being fonder and fonder of him towards the the end of her life by which point Stalin was no longer which is, I mean it's doubly unusual considering her Union. relationship with Trotsky who was certainly not a fan mm, of Stalin no definitely um, not it's yeah it's a bit like it's I think tricky. there's possibly you know if you were going to be as kind as possible she was she was on a lot of painkillers and painkillers and apparently booze. drinking a lot by the end yeah. so true yeah it does it does losing. kind of it's a, a sure sign of, of declining mental health to me um, but again, certainly in, in terms of a favourite about, I mean, I think her just her determination, her grit, regardless of what you think of her political views or anything, for any woman of her time anyway, or any human actually, to go through what she did and to continue to make art, to continue to make art that touches people today, is an incredible thing. She's an, uh, shall we, uh, shall we finish um, on this wonderful quote? Yes, which should, um, which is also part Give of this it. wonderful film we spoke about. It's, uh, I think it's one of her maybe last ones that she, she from her diary. It's definitely quite final. <laughs> I hope the exit is joyful, and I hope never to return. A phrase that only a person who's been in pain all of their life would, I think, would ever yeah. utter. I think it definitely it, it, it's a which, perfect sum up of of her life. Um, it really st it stung me when I heard that in the film because I could feel that she she really really veritably doesn't want to return to this earth that brought so much pain yeah. to her yeah I mean I think you could try and read it in a more positive way instead of think oh well I've done everything I wanted to but no I think in, in her case it's it's been a life of of a huge amount of pain um, a great very successful life in some ways certainly against the odds um, but yeah not one that she ever wants to experience again which is desperately sad um, and does leave you with an enormous amount of respect for her yeah. I think there's no other way to, to look at her you, you have to respect a woman who's managed to and I think she, she is remembered for, for the greatness she represented as a Mexican artist as a Mexican woman mm. as a Mexican independent wom woman you know, who was bisexual. Yeah, I mean, we haven't even time. touched on sort of her feminism here and, and things yeah. like that. There, there, I she mean, is you definitely could do four podcasts on her. Yeah, we, we, and there are loads and loads of much more interesting podcasts about her that oh, you should I listen to. I about more interesting. Who wouldn't want to see us drink beers and ramble? Well, the YouTube, the, the YouTube <laughs> is, is fun, but listen, if you want to know more about Frida, go to In Our Time. By, by Radio or 4 read something else <laughs> or, read, or read a great book about her and go maybe see we'll it. put in our description the, the sources we we looked at uh, sure if you do want to learn a bit more because um, yeah we both did a lot of although we it did. doesn't look like it we both done quite a lot don't, of research don't ever sell us <laughs> we did a lot of research and this is what it boils down to <laughs> Shall, shall we wrap up on our usual bit, the recommendations? Yes. Well, I think for both of us, the, the main recommendation would be uh, to watch Frida, the film from 2002. Yes. With Salma Hayek. Beautiful Salma Hayek. Brilliant. Really wonderful movie and definitely worth the time. And for Dusseldorf? For Dusseldorf, there's a place literally called Frida, which is a tapas bar and restaurant we've both frequented... I even to my parents so it's that good it's that good it's actually it says a lot if you knew his parents um, <laughs> yeah, that's a long story <laughs> you were gonna get some angry emails oh my god <laughs> anyway so the bar the Frida bar is something that we would really recommend we'll provide the details of um, the address in the description and next time we're, we're taking a little bit of a break M Matt is going to get some sand tanks he's big. some sand tanks <laughs> oh my god <laughs> <laughs> we are taking a break um, for, for 16 days. Um, we are. We're both popping off on holiday separately. Separately um, in very different places. I am quite jealous of where <laughs> Matt's going. Be. Um, and we will be back 
on the 21st 21st of july and we've got well i mean meaty in terms of as a as a, as a hunk of work and gristle to get through we're, we're talking oh, ab about ernest hemingway on the 21st of july so there's going to be some serious drinking involved no we we try we're going to try not to get as drunk as uh, hemingway was but um we will probably be heavily drinking and actually i think forming an opinion do you have an opinion of him yet i do I'm, have an opinion of him I'm i am waiting for it to be changed but um i, I do have an i opinion. have a, an opinion and i'm waiting for it to be changed will it change my opinion i will change yours okay we'll, we'll, we'll sway each other anyway please join us then all right this has been me and poison with us matt and Andy. And we'll see you next time. Looking forward to it. Bye. 21st of July.